Hebrew written by Paul or Peter? Well, that was that's an interesting question. Uh, there's about there's four different theories for who the author is. Uh, and first one was that the author was uh, Barnabas. Uh, there were people in the early church that believed Barnabas wrote it. But there's not a lot of evidence for that. And then the next one would be Paul. Uh, but again, there's not a lot of evidence to support. I used to think Paul wrote it forever and then started reading some of these theories and the evidence they have for it. It's like, yeah, it doesn't sound like Paul wrote it. Uh, the two big ones, the big contenders are uh, St. Clement of Rome. He was the Bishop of Rome in the uh, late first, early second century. And uh, Luke is uh, a possible author. And the evidence is strongest for Clement and for Luke, and it's stronger for Clement. I mean, Luke, Luke could be understandable. It could, be, it could have been. We don't know for sure. But uh, we do have some early church fathers that uh, stayed, particularly Origen, who was a, one of the older church fathers, and he stated that his predecessors said, told him that Clement wrote Hebrews. So they'd have some kind of at, like almost firsthand attest, attestation. Did you say that? Yes. Yeah. So there is some evidence for that. Uh, and also Clement is actually mentioned in the New Testament in uh, Philippians 4.3 as being a associate of Paul himself. So this was written to <clears throat> This is written to the Hebrews in Rome. Oh, in Rome? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is to the, the Jewish converts to Christianity in Rome, to the best of our knowledge. And one of the things that's strange about the book is that, you know, it doesn't begin like all the other letters do, where they identify who the author is. It just goes right into... God speaking through this author. And then the uh, also the the first epistle of Clement is the earliest and oldest document of the early church outside of scripture. And then you, you can look at his first epistle and look at Hebrews side by side, and they track very, very closely all the way through the book. Uh, as actually by quoting it. Now, whether he was quoting it or he wrote it and he's just paraphrasing himself, that's one of the theories that he may have been the author. But of course, we don't know for sure. Uh, and it's not important because if it was important, God would have told us he wrote it, wrote it, but he didn't. So it must mean the message is what's more important. And that's what the author is also emphasizing by leaving himself out. He never talks about himself. Uh, and the other important thing is the audience. Um, we don't know who they are, but we do know uh, what they were we know that they knew who the author was from this hints, textual hints here and there, that they knew the author, they had worked with the author, they were looking forward to seeing the author again. So they were some sort of Christian community in Italy, most likely a, a converted Jewish Christian house church somewhere in Rome. But other than that, we can't be more specific. Sure. When you say they knew him, do you think they knew him as like 
a leader or a teacher or more of like yes. a friend? Oh, I think knew him as a pastor. Yeah. That's my impression from what I've read. You know, because he is teaching, he is he, he is preaching in this book, so it's he's right. doing it with some kind of authority. So I would say, I would say they they know him that he, it would make sense that he was a bishop, which is why he's not there with them now. That he was, you know, moving around just like Paul did. You know, Paul was the bishop of a lot of churches. He moved around during his journeys, here and there. Uh, and Timothy went with him. Luke went with him. Uh, you know, Mark went with Peter, and so maybe Clement was with um, Paul, which again we have evidence for that. So, okay. So, who feels like reading Hebrews one five to fourteen, or part of it? I do. Okay. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and to your years will never end. To which the angels did God ever say, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are not the angels ministering spirits Sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Okay. So there's a whole lot of Old Testament in that. But before we go there and look at the structure of what the author just did there, there's a couple of points um, for how the author is, is using this first chapter to not only set the stage for what's coming, uh, but he is also really constructing something that's delightful to the ears, apparently, that, you know, you would really have enjoyed listening to this. Uh, beautiful Greek, uh, playing with a lot of literary devices. Uh, and then he does a, a couple of interesting things with words. Uh, so the preacher, who is quoting God from the Old Testament, he's inviting the hearer to reflect with him on God's words about his son. So the father is teaching us about something about the son and he's comparing them to angels, which is strange at first. So what is he doing? So the author is inviting us to contemplate these things with him. And then grammatically, there's a shift from what they call in Greek is the orist. It's like it's a past tense. Uh, it shifts from that to present to conclusive perfect tenses. We don't quite get that nuance in English. But what's uh, happening with that is those seven quotations then are, are focusing the hearer not only on to what has happened, but what is also happening now within them. Uh, it ties these Old Testament prophecies and fulfillments to the hearer's lives today. And then you hear that repetitive language and, but, and, but, and, but. Oh, what's it doing? And what, what version were you reading? Is it NIV? Yeah. Yeah. What are they saying? Because, you know, it says like in verse five, you know, uh, and, again. and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings, he says, and, and, but of the son, he says, 
and, 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 <laughs> and, but, and, but. And then it gets to the end. And the focus is that last verse. So it's everything grammatically and, and, and structurally is driving us to that last verse. And then he is also uh, doing a, a grammatical change in person to distinguish the, the father speaking to the son and the father speaking to the angels. When he's talking to the son, it is second person singular, uh, you. But it's third person plural for the angels, so it's less formal. Uh, kind of like you would talk to, you know, how would you talk to a servant as opposed to the prince? Kind of. Any what Franco doing? files will see that there's a verb tense for formal you and, yep. and then generic you. Yeah, sure, bro, by King James. That the King James retains all that stuff in English. I didn't think of that. Uh, so it all draws us to the main point in 114. So we're hearing God address the Son directly, and He's also addressing Him, uh, addressing us liturgically in our divine service. So through Jesus being the Son and the Lord begotten from eternity, we now have access through Him to the Father, is the conclusion we're going to be coming to. Uh, and we have that privilege, that right, when we confess Jesus as the Son of God and the Lord. So we'll look at that brief outline of what they're doing in those few verses. So first, it's uh, questions about God's paternal relationship with the Son rather than the angels. So we see God's recognition of the Son. You are my Son, today I have begotten you. That's Psalm 2-7. And then... God's presentation of his son, which is 2 Samuel 7.14. And I gotta find that. And that is in verse 5. Uh, so I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn to the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Uh, is from Deuteronomy 32.43, I think. Uh, Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for his land and his people. And then he affirms the angels as his son's assistants or, or servants. Uh, what the angels got worse than? Uh, Psalm 103, 4. And... Hmm? Psalm 104.4, is that what we're looking for? Is it 104.4? Yes. I have wrote 103.4 by mistake. Yes. Do you have that? No. Yeah. Yeah. He makes winds his messengers, flames of his... Flames of fire, his servants. Right. So that's uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Right there. And then it shifts to God's utterances directly to his son. So he, addressed, he addresses the son as God. Right? Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Uh, Psalm 44, 7 and 8.
But you have saved us from our adversaries, and you have put to shame those who hate us. And God, we have boasted all day long, and we will give thanks to your name forever. And then Psalm 101, verse 26. What? There is no verse 26. Why did I write that? Huh. I wrote down something stupid, so you have to bear with me a minute. <laughs> I wrote some down completely wrong. Are you looking for eight? I think so. There, I can't read my writing. Hmm. I don't know. I'll have to look that up. I wrote something down wrong. But anyway, it begins with it begins with God speaking to the angels, then God speaking to the Son, and then He asks questions on how the Son differs from the angels. He talks about the Son's status as a co-regent with God, and that the angels are God's assistants for the benefit of the heirs of salvation. And the reason why we're going through, the author is doing all of this is because when Christ became incarnate, and we're going to be coming to this conclusion in the next chapter, with, the, with Christ becoming incarnate, you know, Jesus had to do all these things that humans do. He had to go out in the wilderness. He had to be tempted, and he had to withstand temptation. He had to become flesh, where previously he was only spirit. So what the author is doing here is showing how God, in his prophecy in the Old Testament, you know, saying the Messiah is coming, and this is what he's going to do. This is exactly what he did. So... The son had to become incarnate. He had to become less than the angels, is the quote. That he became a little lower than the angels, and now he is exalted at the right hand of God, and he is far above the angels. So the, God is making that qualification with all of these references to the Old Testament. <coughs> if that makes sense. And of course, the the Jewish audience would have been very familiar with the scripture he was citing. Oh yeah, absolutely. <coughs> and that's one of the one of the other things that happens in this book is, you know, the, again, it's a it's a sermon, not quite the sermons like we have today, but it it begins with first, here is the Old Testament text we're going to talk about, and now I'm going to tell you what it means to you, what it means to them in the Old Testament, what it means to you, which in turn means what it means to us today. Uh, and he's going to do that all throughout. So he's going to be opening and expounding upon the Old Testament scriptures as regards the work of Christ, at least in this first section of the book. Okay, but we're not we're not spending a lot of time on the rest of chapter one. Otherwise, we will be here forever if we do every single part of the book. Well, if we're not going to spend much time, I'd like to look at verse fourteen. Sure. The, well, in my Bible, it says, "All the angels are spirits who serve God and are sent to help those who will receive salvation." Yes. Okay. 
Okay, so that's the that's the climax of the chapter. That's the main point. Well, sure, but and it goes of- it goes in hand in hand with chapter two. So we're gonna it, it kind of bridges the next. These chapter divisions are arbitrary. We have to remember. So the the big theme is contained in chapter one with this introductory material, and then it's going to get into it with uh, kind of expound on it further in chapter two, and we will. We will see that, like in Hebrews 2, verse 9 is the, and for a little while he was made lower than the angels. And we're going to see how God lifted him back up to be higher than everything uh, because of his work on the cross, uh, working salvation for the world. So, what I'm interested in is are there places in the Bible that tell us that angels? have been sent to help those who have who believe in Christ. I mean, is there some physical... Yeah, right there. <laughs> well, it just right there, tells us, but I mean, is there... We have examples of it, uh, particularly in Christ's life. You know, the, oh, angels, okay. the angels were ministering to him in the, in the wilderness. The angels ministered right. to him in Gethsemane. Uh, so, yes... But off the top of my head, no. I, I can't think of any where it just specifically says, this is what angels do. No, I don't. I can't think of any. But I will look. That doesn't mean they're not there. It just means I can't think of any. Right. Uh, but the, the thrust, the point of that verse is to remind our hearers that, okay, the angels are servants. You know, but the son is king. The son is lord. The Son is the Son. That's the great name that's above all other names that we talked about uh, last week. So it's kind of like in a little bit longer sermon form what we hear when we hear the voice of the Father from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You know, he is, he is claiming Jesus, the God-man, as his Son. I mean, of course, he's his Son begotten from eternity. But now in human form, the father is still acknowledging, still claiming him as his son. You know, even though he has been made lower than the angels, he's had to take on human flesh, which is his humiliation. His humiliation began when he, when Mary became pregnant with him. So that's, uh, by the way, why I do that little bow in the middle of the creed. And when it says uh, in the Nicene Creed, uh, it says, and became man or was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. And I bow. It's not about Mary. It's about Christ's humiliation. We're acknowledging this is where Jesus lowered himself for us. And so we acknowledge that by bowing a little bit. Um, So this is, so those two instances that we know of in scripture were, or a mountain of transfiguration, you know, this is my beloved son, listen to him. You know, we have those events where the voice of the father comes out and acknowledges the God-man Jesus Christ as being his son. And that's the flavor of what's happening in this first chapter. And it's almost going to sound like it's shifting gears now when he goes to chapter 2. Uh, it does shift a little bit, but all this is leading up to it. So we look at just verses 1 to 4 for now. Yeah. Uh, For this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the words spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders, and by various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Okay, so now the preacher shifts from exposition of Scripture, unpacking Scripture, to exhortation, calling the congregation to do something with what they've just heard. Uh, And this, this... phrase of is kind of fun uh, for this reason we much we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard uh, 
a real literal reading of the Greek is ever increasing attention. So ever increasing attention, uh, because how shall we ourselves escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which after receiving its foundation by being spoken through the Lord was validated for us by those who heard him, which is uh, a little bit of a, a different translation of verse three. And then verse four, with God, according to his will, also corroborating the testimony with signs and wonders and various acts of empowerment and allocations of the Holy Spirit. So now we have this little outline structure, just in these four verses. You know, first, we have the need for the congregation to pay attention to what they've heard from God, which is another reason why this author does not announce, you know, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm with, you know, Aberforth, and we are looking forward to coming to see you in Rome. He doesn't do any of that, no personal greeting. It just goes right into God speaking. So, okay, God has spoken. Now we need to listen to what he said. And then he talks about the penalty for not paying attention. Right? The penalty for in attention to the words spoken by angels. And here, is angel an angel or is angel mean messenger in this case? What do you guys think? I, it doesn't say one way or another. No, but the literal meaning of angel means messenger. So a lot of times especially like in the book of Revelation when it says angel, they're actually talking about pastors uh, as the messengers of the gospel. So we need to pay much closer attention to what we've heard from words spoken by angels, spoken by messengers, and we'll see a little bit more about that further on in the chapter. And then what happens if we don't pay attention to it? Okay, so... If every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, what would that penalty be? Verse 2. Which verse are you on? Chapter 2, verse 2. Okay. If every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape? Well, what's the penalty? Eternal. Right. God only has one penalty. Okay, so if we don't listen to the words he's saying to us, well then, this is what's going to happen. So if we neglect, and this is the preacher's exhortation to not neglect the word, not to neglect listening, paying ever-increasing attention to what God is saying to us. You know, so even if you don't listen to the messenger... There's an even bigger penalty if you don't listen to what's coming to you right from God himself, which is what it's saying here in the second part of verse 3. After it was the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to, uh, confirmed to us by those who heard. Okay, now if we go back to the beginning of chapter 1. <laughs> God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. So we are included. We are included in those to whom God has spoken through his Son by virtue of we're reading his word. Okay, so in this, that next section then, the, well, all the Old Testament stuff we just looked at, the congregation was invited to sit, listen to God as he talked to his son enthroned at his right hand. So we get kind of the eagle's eye view of the father speaking to the son enthroned in heaven with the angels standing by and witnessing also. So now we've seen that scene. And now the preacher is exhorting us to 
by shifting gears, he's exhorting us to um, acknowledge our dependence on God's word because that's how we inherit salvation. If we neglect it, we neglect the salvation. Uh, so they have to, we're being encouraged to have ever increasing attention to what we've heard. And specifically here, in the first century context, they're talking about, as it would be with Jewish converts to Christianity, you would receive instruction in the faith before you get baptized. Similar to what we do today with adults. So babies, we baptize them and then we teach them. Adults, we teach them and then we baptize them. And of course, we never stop being taught. Uh, and it's the encouragement to ensure that they don't f- forfeit the great gift of salvation by not listening to the word. And then he uses this this image of how to do it. Oh, yeah. So he uses that image of, of drifting away. You know, you can almost picture, you know, a ship at anchor. When the ship's at anchor in the harbor, it's solid. It's not going anywhere. But if you don't have a good anchor and the wind picks up, it's going to blow the ship wherever, right? So it has to have that firm anchoring in God's word. If you don't hold fast to God's word, you'll be set adrift. And then our inattention is going to have drastic measures. Let's look at Let's look at Yeah, let's look at Exodus 20. Exodus 20. So Exodus 20 verses 1 through uh, 17, those are the Ten Commandments. Right? Yes. Yes. And if we look before that, so that would be Exodus 19, 4. Yeah, so, you know, God says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you should be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel, he said to Moses. So Moses called the elders together, right? And he told them all that the Lord had spoken to him, and the people said what? That they would do it. That they would do everything that the Lord told them. Right. Exodus 19, verse 8. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And then the Lord said, I will come to you by a thick cloud so that people may hear when I speak to you and may also believe in you forever. So that's a contract. That's a binding covenant. The people said they are going to do this. And if we look at 21, yeah, Exodus 19, 21. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down, warn the people so they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you've warned us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. 
you know, so there's terms and conditions and, and things they have to do. If they didn't do it, what happens to them? Right? They will die. I mean, they will, if they go up on the holy mountain, they're going to die. You can't be in the presence of that. And that is being alluded to in Hebrews chapter 2. This idea of covenant and penalty. Okay, so the penalty at Mount Sinai for disobeying the Lord was death. And then here in Hebrews, he leaves the penalty out. Okay, he doesn't say specifically, this is what's going to happen if you go astray. It just says, yeah, don't do that. You know, there will be consequences to this. But he leaves that up kind of in their mind to think about, well, what, is, what happened to our people in the past? And he is going to return to that kind of thinking uh, again and again. And the, idea, the reason he does that is to engage the hearer, to get them thinking. Like, okay, what is the penalty for this? What is going to happen if I'm inattentive to the word? And then there's three reasons why the message of salvation that is being uttered is valid and certain to the people who hear it. The first one being chapter 2, verse 3. Because its foundation is in Christ as Lord and the founder of salvation, which is in verse 10, uh, for it is fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. So Jesus is both the messenger and the message. And that is in fulfillment of a couple of prophecies from uh, Isaiah 32, 4. Isaiah 32.4 says, The mind of the hasty will discern the truth, and the tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak clearly. And then 49.1, that's talking about uh, preachers. You know, that the preacher of God's salvation will be for all people. And then 49.1, listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named me. And then 49.6, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And then lastly, 42.6. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. So this message of salvation that has been promised is fulfilled and is valid to these people who are hearing and learning it because first off, it's founded in Christ as the cornerstone, as the foundation, as, as Lord and King. And then it is also validated by the people who first heard it. 
uh, to Hebrews 2, verse 3. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. So who were those who heard? Right, our gospel reading for this coming Sunday is Jesus beginning his ministry in Mark chapter 1, where it says, you know, repent. Jesus went out and said, repent and believe the gospel. So Jesus is the messenger and he is also the message. So who are the first ones that heard it? The apostles. The apostles, yes. So the eyewitnesses or ear witnesses, if you'd like. So it is validated through them. But the preacher doesn't emphasize the apostles, kind of like how he's not emphasizing himself. Uh, and by extension, he's talking about pastors throughout, throughout time as speakers of God's words of salvation. But he's using this legal language. Uh, as witnesses, uh, confirming that all the saints have its common inheritance through Christ and that the congregation of true heirs in Christ are the heirs of all things and all things that belong to him. And then we can kind of extrapolate from that. So in our divine service, we have an unbroken chain of a tradition, excuse me, an unbroken train of a tradition of delivering the message of salvation, which is not only from the past to the present, uh, but it is also from heaven to earth via the testimony of the eyewitnesses. So we have scripture, takes us to the beginning, takes us to the cross, takes us to our sanctuary on Sunday morning. And then because... Jesus is enthroned at the right hand of the Father. It is also coming from heaven to us. So it's basically all time and space. Uh, so that message is for all times, all places, uh, and heaven comes to earth. And then it also says there in verse 4, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. Uh, so God himself corroborates the testimony of these witnesses by the acts that he accomplishes through them. The miracles. Right, so you have Jesus' miracles and exorcisms and all the things Jesus did. And also the apostles. So if you look at uh, Acts, you see the remarkable things that the apostles are doing. But then once the apostles are gone, that goes away. They don't, even though we have this unbroken succession of pastors from, from the apostles to us today, we don't have incredible apostle powers. We can't raise the dead. We can't. Your shadow doesn't heal. Yeah, my shadow doesn't heal anybody that I know of, uh, like Peter's did. But God gave them those signs and wonders because they're proclaiming the risen Christ. And everybody goes, you know, nobody denied that Jesus performed miracles, right? The Pharisees never said, oh, he didn't do all this. He's like, how is he doing these things? He must be in league with the devil. They didn't deny that he was performing miracles. And now Jesus has ascended, and now the apostles are beginning the church, and they can do all these remarkable things, including raising the dead, casting out demons, healing the sick, and preaching repentance to the forgiveness of sins. It's the full package. And they can do anything that Jesus was doing, they can do, because he gave that to them to do. You know, he was the once for all atoning sacrifice, his special work on the cross for us. But all of the things he did in his ministry the apostles had the power and authority to do. So signs and wonders, because we, we need signs and wonders. We need to see things. You know, just like Jesus said, you know, take up your bed and walk, and your sins are forgiven you, which is harder to say. It's harder to say, take up your bed and walk, because he's got to get up and walk. Anybody can say your sins are forgiven. You can't see that they are forgiven. Anybody can say that, right? but to show that he had the authority. By whose authority does he cast out, does he forgive sins? Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. So there, the miracle proved the authority he had to 
forgive sins. Okay, so, and I, some people like to like to think that that kind of stuff is supposed to be the evidence to convince a skeptic, and it's not. It's not going to convince a skeptic. It's going to strengthen the faith of those who already trust in God's word. That's going to, signs and wonders will strengthen those kinds of things. But yes, skeptics, they've got different things you have to do. Because I can tell them that Jesus healed and cast out demons and did all these things, and they prove it. I mean, that's where it stops a lot of the time. Okay, and then there's this weird little phrase, gifts of the Holy Spirit, where he gives, you know, the verb for that, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. The question we need to answer there is, is it the Spirit distributing gifts or is it the Father distributing the Spirit. So this is by various miracles, by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Is it the Spirit being given, or is it the Spirit giving giving the gifts? No, it's, it's him because the Spirit's doing it according to his will. Okay, who him? Well, that would be Jesus at this point, wasn't it? Not God? I think it's God. You think it's God? Okay. Well, okay, so is is, is Jesus giving the Spirit to people, or is he giving the Spirit who then distributes spiritual gifts? He's giving to the Spirit. Yeah, he's, the spirit he's, he's, he's working through the Spirit. He's giving the Spirit. Yeah. yeah, he's giving the Spirit. Sometimes people want to make that about charismatic gifts and like speaking in tongues and and I don't mean Pentecost speaking in tongues I mean like blah 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 crazy stuff where people think they're speaking in tongues but nobody can understand them uh, but they try to use texts like that first to say well you see that's where God distributes these kind of charismatic gifts it's like no he gives us gifts of the spirit but and maybe he does give some to some people the ability to speak in tongues but but it's not, it's not a, a charismatic proof text is what they would want to call it. That somehow you, you're touched by the Spirit and you have these special abilities. That's kind of not what the Bible teaches. Okay. So it's God allocating, if you want to use that as a word, uh, giving the Holy Spirit accompanying and then back then accompanying signs and wonders and acts of empowerment through the preaching of the gospel. Whereas we today have acts of empowerment from hearing the gospel because hearing the gospel gives us the Holy Spirit, which gives us the ability to believe. Okay, so this preacher is speaking to a community about God's conversation with his son who he acknowledges is his a son begotten eternally begotten from eternity who had no beginning and has no end and then shows that he has given him all authority and then tells us that he is the author of our salvation, and that is what we're supposed to believe in. Now you can say, yeah, we knew that. Because, <laughs> yeah, we knew that. That's the gospel, right? But that's the, that's the reason this writer is writing it this way. Um, especially for this congregation of Jewish converts. Okay, so they're, you know, they're going to have that old covenant in their head. And now they have to hear how all of that is fulfilled in Christ, and this is how salvation works. So each one of these little house church congregations is a community of people who hear, who have 
ears, and they are dependent on the voice of God through God's word about his son. And once you do that, you've created the church. So the church is our what we do here on earth that mirrors what takes place in the heavenly throne room. So it's a heavenly community, except here on earth. And in that church, in that community, that creates and maintains and nourishes faith in those who hear the message. So it's not just about knowledge or facts or teaching or understanding. It's about salvation itself. Uh, and one of, the, one of the difficult passages in our Lutheran confessions is this line that says, outside the church there is no forgiveness of sins and no salvation. That sounds bad, doesn't it? It's like, really? And that's kind of where this author is going to be going. You know, so, because where do you receive forgiveness of sins? Where do you receive the benefits of what Christ did for us? You receive that through the means of grace, which you get in church. You don't get the Lord's Supper outside of church. But yeah, you can't. I mean, we can bring it to you. That's not what I'm saying. But, you know, outside that community, you have to belong to a congregation. We can talk more about that. Uh, but, yeah, we are supposed to be a communal group for mutual benefit and to receive together the gifts. Does the thou shall not forsake the assembly fall under there somewhere? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, where do I want to go next? Does that make sense? But once we get past this chapter, it's going to get a lot easier to talk about. There's a, a lot of stuff going on in this first two chapters. That, you know, on the surface, it's pretty simple. And then underneath, it gets interesting and complicated. But the gist of it is that simple that, okay... God acknowledges that's his son who he made for a time lower than the angels. We're coming to that verse, I promise. So I, the father, acknowledge my son, even though I made him a little less than the angels for a while. I gave him a job to do. He did it perfectly for you. Believe this. And now I'm going to give signs and wonders to these first groups of teachers so they can share and say, hey, this is what we heard from Jesus. Look, boom. And then on, 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 on through the continuity of the church through time. That this is where the message is proclaimed and this is where the benefit of that hearing takes place. Where you get forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Okay. If we jump to the toward the end of chapter two, verse eight, uh, for in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And that's getting a little, a little ahead of us maybe, but. And then all this declaration of gospel um, leads us to think about, well, we get this by hearing. So how do you be a good attentive hearer? How do you pay ever closer attention? As he said. So we've got two kind of two aspects to listening. So we listen to those who are given to us to proclaim it. Uh, who received it from 
the people that taught him, who received it from the people that taught him, who received it, blah, 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 to the apostles, who received it from Jesus Christ. Okay, so we listen to them. We believe they have that authority to proclaim that. But then also we hear from our risen Lord himself speaking to us in the divine service. We have his words. We have his gospel, the words he uttered. So we not, don't just have somebody that interprets it for us and preaches at us. We also have the word there just being read and proclaimed. And then the way that benefit is added to us is the rejuvenating of our baptized selves. So we're reborn in baptism. And then every time we gather, we're rejuvenated in that new creation we became over and over all the time by his body and blood, by confession and absolution, and so on. So as the hearers pay ever closer attention to God's word, then they grow in their capacity to abound in the better things that belong to their salvation. Look at, we have to skip ahead for this, but chapter 6, verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 9 says, But, beloved, we are convinced of better, better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way, for God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love with which you have shown toward his name, in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. So, as we receive the forgiveness of sins, as we receive restoration, the medicine of eternal life, then we grow in our ability to do what? What's our only purpose? Worship and serve. What's our other only purpose? <laughs> that is true. Tell others. All right, to be a neighbor to be a neighbor to someone for our good works. Our good works don't merit us anything. They don't add to our salvation, but they are our compulsion through the Holy Spirit. We do good things for our neighbor in response to the grace that we have been shown. And as we continue listening to the word and pay ever closer attention to it, we gradually begin to understand that better, right? Because as we get older, as we become more mature in the faith, we realize that it's not all about me. It's really not about me at all. Loathed as I am to admit that because I kind of love myself. But we realize it's not about me. It's about what I do for others. And it's not me doing that. It's God working through me. So that someone else may come to faith through that. And I should probably stop there for this week, but I am going to, I said this last week too, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read Luther at you. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, the third commandment, right? The meaning of the third commandment, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. And in the large catechism, Luther says, because I know sometimes people are just like, ah, oh, come on, the catechism, really? We got confirmed like a million years ago. But yeah. Luther says, therefore, for God's sake, I beg such lazy believers or arrogant saints to be persuaded and believe that they are truly, truly not so learned or such great doctors as they imagine. They should never assume that they have finished learning the parts of the catechism or know it well enough in all points, even though they think that they know it ever so well. For even if they know and understand the catechism perfectly, which, however, is impossible in this life, there are still many benefits and fruits to be gained if it is daily read and practiced in thought and speech. For example, the Holy Spirit is present in such reading, repetition, and meditation. He bestows ever new and more light and devoutness. In this way, the catechism is daily loved and appreciated better. As Christ promises in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Besides, catechism study is a most effective help against the devil, the world, and the flesh, and all evil thoughts. It helps to be occupied with God's word, to speak it and meditate on it, just as the first psalm declares, people blessed who meditate on God's law day and night. 
Certainly you will not release a stronger incense or other repellent against the devil than to be engaged by God's commandments and words and speak, sing, or, th speak, sing, or think them. For this is indeed the true holy water and holy sign from which the devil runs and by which he may be driven away. He had a way of words. You know, and again, when Luther says the catechism, he doesn't mean, he doesn't even mean the what does this mean that he wrote. He just means the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. Say them every day. Say them a couple times a day. Because, uh, yeah, it's basic. But when you really think about it, well, that's the stuff we're supposed to be thinking of. When we really think about the Ten Commandments, we really think about not just the thou shalt nots, but the thou shalts that we don't think about being the opposite, that we find all kinds of stuff we can do and work on to try to be a little better, to play ever closer attention to the word, which is what the author of this letter is exhorting us to do. Okay. So I know tonight's lesson was a little odd. It's not like we usually do it a bit. Um, sorry about that, but <laughs> I had to get through it. Uh, and there's just a, a ton of interesting stuff there, and I, we could spend much, much more time just on these first two chapters. There's that much stuff going on, on there and things we could look at in the Old Testament, but we got the gist of it. So next time we will be looking at the remainder of chapter two, and then we will pick up the pace a little bit. We won't get so bogged down in structure and these things. I just wanted to show all that to you guys because it's we don't usually pay attention to that stuff sometimes. I think it can add a dimension to your Bible study once in a while to look at that stuff. And this is an interesting book. But next time, we are going to look at, and we're going to be in not in the Old Testament so much as we're going to see how the author continues to use Old Testament things uh, to show us about Christ and how Christ is the better and greater fulfillment of a lot of the things that we had in the Old Covenant. So we will talk about Jesus as high priest in contrast to the high priest of Israel back in Old Testament time. So we'll talk about the, the Levitical priests and their service and how it was instituted. And we'll look at all the parallels between Christ and that Old Testament system. And then we will uh, pretty much talk about that in the context of worship. And basically we're going to talk about how we, because Christ is our great high priest and uh, king, how we are also uh, co-heirs co of, of uh, whatever belongs to the Son. So, yeah, Jesus is enthroned at the right hand of God in glory, and so are we. Which, well, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll get into that kind of stuff next week. And it'll also wrap up why they were talking about angels before. But there was an, there's an, oh, no, spoiler alert, there's an old uh, kind of Jewish tradition back in, in Old Testament times uh, where God, you know, divided up the ethnic groups of the, you know, his tribes. And he set them together and then gave them a region, but there was an angel in charge over them. I don't know if you want to call it a guardian angel. I've got to find a way to describe it better. But so God gave his tribe a territory, and there's an angel that was over them. And that's a Jewish, uh, uh, the, 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 the territory, the uh, group was under the, they were subordinate to the angel. Uh, in the heavenly hierarchy, for lack of a better term. But I'll find a w better way to explain that, because that sounds really strange. Uh, but that's why this whole, why Jesus is better than the angels, even though he was lower than them at a the time. They're, it, they're putting to rest some of this uh, kind of old Jewish, a uh, little bit of mysticism, to be honest. Uh, so we'll talk about that very briefly next time. And then we'll talk about the rest of the chapter in a little bit of detail.
And then we will see how the author of Hebrews is going through all the different sections for the rest of the book. And the way we'll do that is we're going to look at only the texts that um, only the texts that we use in worship or that we can use in worship that are on that, that little sheet. 